Amen. You may be seated there. How you doing? You doing good? Hey, you okay with who you're sitting next to? Or will you? 20 bucks, I'll get you a change here. Just so good to have you, especially if uh, you're new to our church. I, I, I was sitting down, or I was standing during the worship, and I like to remind myself that I, I was raised in the Catholic church. Anybody, how many were raised Catholic? Want me to see your hand? Just, yeah. And I remember being raised Catholic, it was kind of like stand, kneel, sit, stand, kneel, sit, peace be with you. And the first time I went to a church like this, I honestly, I was like, what in the world is going on in here? And uh, I'm like, they're a little cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. And um, so it was different to me. It was uh, a lot different. The worship was different, but I, I knew some of the people that were at the service and they had something that I didn't have. They had some something, although I didn't understand the worship and the way to do worship, it was... I knew that they had something that I didn't have, and I discovered, even having been raised Catholic, I never personally knew the Lord. And God got a hold of me, and then I started reading the book of Psalms. And you think, like you think the wor- worship tonight was like outgoing and expressive, you should read the book of Psalms, because they're standing, kneeling, shouting. Um, they got all kinds of symbols, they're crashing. And uh, so we're, we're just trying to be a biblical church. And I tell the church all the time, if we're gonna get excited for our five-year-old kicking a soccer goal, or our 10 year old making, you know, hitting a home run, how much more the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We're excited about that. So that's why we clap and shout and do all those things. And I, I pretty much say this every Easter, this, this day for the Christian, for the follower of Jesus Christ. I mean, oh, this is kind of like our Super Bowl. Like for, if you're an actress, I guess, what is it, the Oscars? Is that the big, is it, I guess the Oscars would be a big deal. If you're a big athlete, it's football it would be the Super Bowl. Right now we got March Madness going on. Uh, you got the Olympics coming up this summer. And uh, so every, all, all the athletes have their sport. The entertainers have their sport. But how many know that Easter weekend, this is our day because Jesus Christ is alive. Come on, even if you're Methodist or Presbyterian, put your hands together and give God some praise. Amen. He is alive. All right. If you uh, have a Bible, if you happen to bring a Bible, please turn with me to the book of John. And uh, we do this two times a year. Typically, we don't put a lot of the verses up on the screen because then you wouldn't have to bring your Bible. But at Christmas time and Easter, we put a lot of the verses up on the screen. If you have a Bible, please turn to John uh, chapter 11. If you don't, it's okay because uh, the verses are coming up on the screen. John chapter 11 and the... These two verses have to be my favorite resurrection verses. There's a lot of great ones, and we'll look at a couple other ones, but there's just two verses. I want you to see this. John chapter 11, verse 25 and 26. Notice, Jesus said to her, talking to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Let's all say that together, ready? I am the, come on now, act like you're awake and you had your frappuccino already, okay? At the count of three, one, two, three, go. I am let me just stop there. Notice he doesn't say, I'm able to resurrect. He, said, he didn't say it's a possibility that I might resurrect. He said, I am. Someone say, I am. The resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Here it is. Do you believe this? Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Do you believe this? Lord, thank you for the word of God. I, I just pray that you would speak to us tonight about the resurrected King. We love you, we acknowledge you, we invite your presence in this place and into our hearts. We give you all the thanks and all the praise in Jesus' name and someone said amen. amen. I love that, I am the resurrection in life. Look up here for a second. I haven't seen you guys since, some of you since Christmas. That's terrible, I'm so sorry. What a terrible way to start. I'm, I apologize, I don't mean it. Let me rewind the time. I'm sorry, I had it so bad. So, you still love me? What was I saying? That was, that was pretty funny. I might use it tomorrow too. Um, although some of you were offended. Uh, but, but he says, I am the resurrection and the life. I, I love that. So, so again, not that I could or I'm able to, but I am. And uh, that, that means Jesus who resurrected for the life. So in other words, Easter is not just a holiday, something we celebrate one time a year. Easter is about the resurrection of Christ, and because he said he is the resurrection and the Christ, that means that Jesus Christ still tonight, still today, still in my lap, will still raise dead things. 
How many are grateful for that? Your marriage might be falling, God can raise your marriage. Your kids might be going wayward, but God can raise your family. Your finances might be in the toilet. How many know God can raise your financial situation? I love that, I love that. And so he's still in the business of resurrecting dead places. I wanna talk tonight about Jesus, the King. Say it with me, Jesus. And we're gonna, we're gonna play a little game, okay? A little, little name that King game. Okay, we got a couple of pictures coming up. First picture, when you, think of, when you think of Simba and Mufasa, you think of? I can't hear you, what? Lion King, okay, n- next picture. When you think of a big gorilla, you think of? All right, good, good, two for two. Next, when you think of a whopper, when you think of a whopper, you think of what? Hold the pickle, hold the lettuce, special orders, don't upset. Hey, by the way, do you ever, this, that's old school. Do you ever notice that you never go to Burger King? You wind up at Burger King. Everything else is closed, okay. So when you think of a Whopper, you think of, say it with me, Burger King. Okay, when you think of a scary novel, you think of, good, Stephen King. When you think of basketball, the NBA, the Los Angeles Lakers, you think of LeBron King. That's what he calls himself, okay? By the way, I'm not not gonna ruffle your feathers. I already got you mad, but I just wanna tell you, I played basketball in high school and college. Michael Jordan is still the GOAT, okay? So don't don't send me any nasty emails, okay? So LeBron could call himself the king, but actually Michael Jordan is. Now they're gonna get harder. I got three more, ready? This is for all the old people. Next picture. Billie Jean King. One of the greatest uh, female tennis players of all time. Next picture, next picture. When you think of, who was that? that was, you were excited over there, wow. We need security. Uh, when, you, when you think of the blues, you think of BB King. When you think of jazz, you think of Nat King Cole. And here's my favorite. When you think of rap music, you think of, what's his name? <laughs> Kanye West, his new name. I don't even know, what's his new name? Yee, yee. But he, he's the only one that gets it right. Because on his album, he says, what? Jesus is king. Jesus is king. I want to talk about that tonight. Je- Come on, say it with me. Jesus is king. And, and so all week long, look up here for a second. All week long, I, just, I, I probably asked 12 to 15 people, just an informal survey. And I said, hey, do you know, and they're, they're all Christians. Everybody went to our church. I said, hey, do you know what, what claim or what charge Jesus made to get him on the cross? So I think maybe 12 people I interviewed, only, only like two out of 12 got it. Tw- that's less than 20%. And uh, so I want to answer that question. The charge that got Jesus Christ on the cross. So let's talk about the first point. Would you write this down in your notes? Number one, I want to talk about, I want to talk about, first of all, his claim as king. His claim. Write that down. Point number one, his claim. You were in the book of John. Just turn over two books to your left. I want you to look at Matthew chapter 27 and verse 11. Matthew 27 Verse 11, his claim. Someone say his claim. Verse 11 says, meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor, Pilate, asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Notice what Jesus answered. You have said so, Jesus replied. In other words, amen. You got that right. He didn't push back. He didn't argue with Pilate. He said, no, exactly. I claim to be king, and I am king. I thought I'd get more feedback from that. He, he is king, amen? And that, that's the claim. That's what put him on the cross is he claimed to be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. When you look at verse 28 and 9, same chapter, Matthew 27, notice they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then they twisted together a crown of thorns. They set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. Then they knelt in front of him and notice this. And what did they do? They mocked him and they said, hail king of the Jews. They weren't saying it like, we believe you're king of the Jews. No, they mocked him. And how many know that non-Christians and Christians alike are still mocking him? Non-Christians are saying he was just a good teacher. He was just a prophet. He really wasn't savior or king or Lord. And they ultimately reject him. But how many know a lot of Christians mock Jesus today because they, 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 want, they want his benefit and his blessing they don't want him to be king and lord of their lives. They, they, listen, they love forgiving God, grace God, mercy God, 
heaven God. God's gonna turn all the evils in my life around for good. We, we love that. But we don't want to call him king and lord because when we call him king and lord, then we have to surrender and submit to his lordship. So I, I just want to ask you tonight, who, who is Jesus to you? So the, the Mormon church would say, well, Jesus was a spirit child of the heavenly father and heavenly mother. We refer to Jesus as the brother of Lucifer. They said, Mormons say, we refer to Jesus as the brother of Lucifer, uh, the brother of Satan. All of God's people said, no, that's not true. And they said, Jesus was a small G God, and we all can be small G gods. Jehovah's Witnesses say, they believe Jesus is separate from God the Father and not part of the Trinity. They do not believe that Jesus Christ is God. Muslims believe that he was created being and not God the Son. He was a prophet, but a lesser prophet than their prophet, Muhammad. Scientologists say that Jesus was simply a good teacher, but not God, and only reached legendary status over time. Here is the problem. Jesus claimed he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So we're gonna bring, believe Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness, Muslims, or we're gonna believe what Jesus said about himself. Check it out. He said, Jesus said it in John 8. He said, before Abraham was, I am. Check it out. Do you know Abraham lived 2,000 years before Jesus was born? So Jesus said in John 8, before Abraham ever existed, I already existed. In John 14, the Bible says, he says, whoever has seen me, Jesus said, they've seen the Father. And at the end of John chapter 14, when the disciples were in a storm and God stopped the storm and they began to worship Jesus, you know what he did? He received the worship because he's God. So his claim that put him on the cross was God. King of kings and Lord of lords. Somebody believe he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Now, look, it's really hard for us us living in America to understand kingship and a kingdom. I just want you to look up at the screen because we live in a democracy, right? And here's a couple things about a democracy. Number one, we the people. We the people. The second thing about my opinion and vote matters. In other words, if you don't like a law, I mean, we can... We can vote new members, new legislators to come in and change the law. Most other countries can't do that, but we the people, my opinion and vote matters, and in our country, listen, we're self-ruled. So we have a president, we have a Congress and a Senate, we have a Supreme Court, but I mean, it's we the people, we get to call the shot. Now listen carefully, when it comes to politics and government, I'm all for democracy. Why do you think millions of people are trying to get into our country? because it's the best form of government, right? Here's the problem though. The Bible wasn't written with democracy in mind. It was written with a king and a kingdom. Let me tell you what's true about a king and a kingdom. Ready? God wrote a book. God wrote a book. This is God's word, 66 books, written over 1,400 years. And let me know, you might have an opinion, I might have an opinion, it doesn't matter what our opinion is, because God wrote a book. Huh? And so check it out, because he wrote a book, he calls the shots on how I live my life, what I do with my finances, the kind of spouse that I'll choose, what I, what I do with my money, how I raise my kids. So in a kingdom, God wrote a book, and check it out, number two, I don't get to vote. I got saved in 1985, almost 40 years I've been serving the Lord, check this out, not one time has God ever said, hey, Steve, what do you think? He's never one time asked me my opinion, never. Isn't that shocking? No, he wrote a book and I don't get to vote. He is the king. And check it out, I am not self-ruled, I am what? God ruled. So we have a king and a kingdom. And check it out, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, how many know that you're a prince or a princess in the kingdom? You're not some leftover. Here's what 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9 says. Look at this verse. 1 Peter 2 9, you are a what? Check, by the way, do you know the Bible says before the foundations of the earth, God put his, he, he said, I chose you. He already cho- chose, so I'm a chosen people. Here it is, I'm, I'm royalty. I'm a royal priest. I'm a holy nation. Here it, I'm God's very own special possession. Someone say amen to that. Amen. So again, let me say this. We like his attributes, but we don't like his absolutes. I'll come over to this section and I'll get some amens over here. 
We, we, like his, we like his attributes. What is his attributes? He's loving. He's all-knowing, right? He's in control. He's on the throne. He doesn't get worried. He's not anxious, right? He's all those things. So we love that about God, but we don't like his absolutes. We like his attributes. But when he says, no, this is how you're to live your life, we're like, ah, I don't know about that. And we push back on the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now, I guess why I'm preaching so strong, it's two events in my life over the last 39 years as I've been serving the Lord, because here's what I know. Every year at Easter and Christmas, a lot of people that come to church for a lot of different reasons, and we're glad you're here, honestly. Some people come out of obligation, some people can't, because you got dragged here. Somebody, somebody, somebody in your family or friend, they lied to you. They said, let's go to dinner. You're like, sweet. And they said, we're buying. And then you get in the car and you were like, what? We're at church? And we cut, but here's what I know. Every year in every church all over the world, people come out of obligation. We come out of whatever, it's Easter, or it's Christmas Eve. And, and, but I just wonder, how, it's this stuff that keeps me up at night. That just because we go to a church, we think that we're going to heaven. And it's two events that kind of stick out. Num- number one, I was a youth pastor before we started the church in 97. And I remember we went with three other youth groups. We were in Mexico, and we were around a concrete mixer. And I was talking to the, this youth pastor next to me, and I forget what denomination his... Uh, he was a part of, but we're, we're mixing concrete. I don't know jack about concrete. I'm just faking it. Uh, I don't know how to fix anything. And uh, I just remember what he said. He said, you're not going to believe this. He said, earlier this summer, listen, he said, my pastor, so his, his senior pastor, my senior pastor led about four or five other pastors in our denomination to the Lord. Excuse me? He said, yeah, yeah. My pastor led four or five other pastors in our denomination to the Lord. I'm like, what? He said, yeah, they weren't. They weren't saved. They weren't Christians. It was, it was more of a profession. It was an office. It was an occupation. I'm like, are you kidding me? How could you be a pastor of a church and not even be born again, not even be saved? The second event, before we had this stage, some of you were part of our church. We used to just have stairs that went down, like this brown carpet and stuff. So now it's different. We have like this whole military zone, and we've got security all over the place. So if you try to attack me, you get tackled and we got, we got hidden grenades under there. We've got invisible barbed wire that you can't see. But back in the day, I remember I was just done preaching. I was going to head back, and the guy met me up here. And he just says, hey, I just got to be honest with you. He, and I know he was coming to our church for a while. I got, I got to be honest. He says, my marriage is falling apart. My kids are falling apart. My job's falling apart. My life is falling apart. I ain't buying this Jesus stuff. I said, okay. And then I just said, hey, tell me about your, tell me about your salvation, your when did you get born again? When did you give your life to the Lord? And he just started talking to me, and he, 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 he couldn't give me a date or a day. Here's basically what he said. I'll never forget this. I said, well, how do you know you're a Christian? He says, well, I was born in the South. <laughs> huh? He was dead serious. And this wasn't a guy that came once or twice. This is a guy that was here every Sunday. He actually thought he was going to heaven because he was born in the South to Christian parents. This is the stuff that keeps me up at night. He claimed to be the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and he either is or he isn't. Are you a Christian? Of course. I'm at church on Easter. I would say this, of course, maybe. 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 He claimed to be king. Here's the second thing I want to talk about. Not only his claim, but number two, his conquest. We sang about it earlier. He conquered death hell, and the grave. Are you grateful for that? His conquest. Check it out. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is not accidental. It's not incidental. It's fundamental to what you and I believe. Check it out. If we went to Muhammad's grave right now, I don't even know where it's at. Probably somewhere in the Middle East. But if we made our way to Muhammad's grave, guess what? His body would still be there. Joseph Smith, the one that started Mormonism. If we track down his grave, I, I imagine it's probably in Salt Lake City. And we went to the grave of Joseph Smith, and we dug it up, his body would still be in the grave. And he ever, every other world religious leader, but check it out, you go to the grave of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago, he is risen. <laughs> now listen, how I many you know, every world religion can compete on Christianity and on a lot of things. They can say, hey, you have a holy book? We have a holy book. You have a place to gather to worship? We have places to gather of worship. You have a, you have a, 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 a holy founder, a good teacher. We have the same thing, but here's what they can't compete. 
Jesus is the only one that claimed to rise from the dead, and he did. Would someone put your hands together and give God some praise? His claim and his conquest. Listen to the, the Apostle Paul writing in 1 Corinthians 15. You don't need to turn there. The Apostle Paul said, if the resurrection of Jesus Christ didn't happen, he listed like six things. Listen. He said, our preaching is useless. In other words, what I'm doing is a waste of time. And what you're doing, why did you come tonight? Why, why open up the Bible? It's a waste of time. I went to Bible college for four years, a waste of time and money if the resurrection didn't happen. Number two, he says, our faith is futile. Why, why read your Bible? Why give? Why come to church? Like, we're wasting our time. Our faith is a joke. It's futile. Number three, he said, we're stuck in our sins if the resurrection didn't happen. But how many are grateful that God forgives us of our sins? If the resurrection didn't happen, we're eternally lost. We have no hope. And Paul goes on to say, and we're pitied beyond all people because we've wasted our life on a lie, but he did rise again, and right now he's seated at the right hand of the Father. Check out this verse, Revelation 1, 17 and 18 on the screen. It says, when I saw him, this is John writing, I fell at his feet as, I, as though I were dead, but he laid his right hand on me and said, don't be afraid, I'm the first and the last. Look at this, I am the living one. I died, but look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and the grave. He conquered death, hell, and the grave. Come on, one more time. Let's just put our hands together for the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Here's the third thing. Number one, his claim is king. Number two, his conquest. Number three, his coming. His coming. Someone say his coming. Check it out. You know, the first time he came, he came as an innocent baby. He came, and I mean, you know, the Bible says in Matthew 2 and Luke 2 that there was no room for Jesus in the inn. Can you imagine? No. No rooms left for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. When he, came, he didn't come to a bunch of fanfare. He didn't sing at the halftime of the Super Bowl. The Bible says he was rejected by his own people. That's the first time that he came, but how many know that he's coming again? And uh, when he comes again, look at this passage, Revelation chapter 19, verse 11 through 16. This is going to fire you up. So this is a second coming. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like a blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on it that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean, coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On, on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written. Say it with me. King of kings. So next time he's coming back in power. Next time he's coming back in triumph. Next time nobody can reject him. Look at this verse. This is, a great, this is a great resurrection verse. Romans chapter eight, verse 11. Look at this verse. The spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead. We've been celebrating that. But check it out. That same spirit, if you're a Christian, what does it say? What? This is another thing. No other world religion has their God living inside of them except Christianity. This is so powerful that the, the same Holy Spirit that rose Jesus Christ from the grave, which took power, lives in you. And just as God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same spirit living within you. Good news, God is still raising dead situations, dead circumstances, dead finances. So listen, you can't, in, in, you can't enact the power of the king until you, first of all, embrace the king of kings. You can't have the power you can't have the glory, you can't have the blessing, you can't have the benefit unless you embrace his kingship. I'm not a big uh, British royalty guy. My wife kind of likes some of that stuff. Um, but I, I remember Queen Elizabeth died in September of 2022. Uh, yeah, 22. So she, she was on the throne for 60 years. And I want you to see a couple pictures. The first, the first thing that the king or queen holds in the British royalty if we could see that picture coming up on the screen right now. That, that's an actual diamond. It's, it's the largest 
It's the largest cut diamond in the world. It's called the Cullinan One. Ready? 535 carats. So all the wives turn to your husband and say, time for an upgrade. <laughs> so the king or the queen will, would hold, hold that scepter, 535 carats. They're saying it's, it's worth somewhere around a half a billion dollars. So not only did they carry the, the sovereign scepter, the next picture is the king and the queen. So that, that diamond on the bottom is actually the second largest diamond in the world. Let me make sure I get... The weight is 317.4 carats. So they hold the scepter and they put the crown on their heads. And so she died. Queen Elizabeth died in September, September 8th, 2022. Listen, the second she died, King Charles, I mean, the minute she took her last breath, King Charles was king of Britain. I mean, like that. By the way, they put the crown on imperfect people. But the second she died, she went to eternity. He was the king. But check it out. It wasn't until eight months later that he was actually coronated king. So he was king when she took her last breath, but he wasn't coronated for eight months later. Let me say this. Jesus Christ is the king of kings. Flat out. But I, I just want to say this, but he's not your king until you coronate him. He is king, but he, he's not your king until you coronate him. I want, to, I want to end the sermon with one last reference to an Old Testament king. His name was King Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel. You can read it later. He actually was the king over Persia, which is present-day Iraq, 600 B.C., Listen, he was smart, gifted, intelligent, and ready? Arrogant. Arrogant. Because he thought that he's the one that built this kingdom. So one night he had a dream, and this dream was a beautiful, luscious, gorgeous tree. And it stretched out over his, his life, over his family, over his country, over his kingdom. And then in the dream, it got cut down to a stump. So he's wondering, why did he get cut down to a stump? And so he called his false prophets, he called his magicians, he called his enchanters, and they said, hey, can you tell us what the dream is? I I just saw a dream, this beautiful tree penetrating my my family and my country and my kingdom. And then it got cut down to the stump. And none of the astrologers and enchanters could figure out why. Someone said, hey, there's there's a young Hebrew kid by the name of Daniel. He talks to God and God talks to him. Why don't you bring him in? He might be able to explain the dream to you. So Daniel comes into the kingdom, and he says, hey, here's the dream. He says, yeah, yeah, I know. He says, do you have the interpretation? He says, I do, but you're not going to like it. He looked at King Nebuchadnezzar, and he said, you are the tree. See, you thought that because you built this kingdom, it's because of your achievement, your success, your gifting, your talent. But listen, God's taking everything away from you. Because he is the king, not you. So check it out. Look at this, Daniel chapter 4, verse 24 and 25. This is what the dream means. Your majesty, what the Most High has declared will happen to my Lord the King. You will be driven from human society. You will live in the fields with the wild animals. You will eat grass like a cow, and you will be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let me just stop right there. Most theologians, that's people that study the Bible, they don't believe that it was an actual physical thing, that he didn't get down on fours and eat grass but it's figurative. Basically, here's the, you're going to, hey, you're going to lose everything. And you can read it later, Daniel chapter four. Listen, here's what the Bible says. He lost his mind. Listen, and he went insane. You know, actually, extra biblical literature outside of the Bible, this is also true. That They wrote that King Nebuchadnezzar actually lost his mind and he went insane. Please look at me. Some of you, that's your life right now. Maybe you haven't lost your mind, but you lost your spouse. You lost your hope, you lost your joy, you lost your kid, you lost a relationship, you lost your health. 
I don't know, maybe it's because I'm getting older and my own diagnosis, I'm just so more sympathetic and empathetic toward people that are suffering. And I just, I, I sat with the, some people in our church last Sunday in the lobby, just tears coming down their face because somebody in our church who they're related to died tragically at 35 years old. Tears coming down their face. So my heart bleeds and breaks for you. anybody in the room that you, you just, man, I've lost my mind. My, my life's insane right now. Let's, let's go on. Here's what the passage says. It says, seven periods of time will pass while you live this way until you learn that the most high rules over the kingdoms of the world and gives them to anyone he chooses. But the stump and the roots of the tree were left in the ground. This means that you will receive your kingdom back when you have learned that heaven rules. In other words, you're going to get the kingdom back when you understand that he is the king and not you. So God gave him a warning. Unfortunately, he didn't heed the warning and he lost his mind. He lost his sanity. He lost it all. But praise God, a year la- exactly a year later to the day, he repented Turn back to the Lord, and here's what Daniel chapter 4, verse 34 says. After this time had passed, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven. My sanity, what? Returned. And I praised and worshiped the Most High and honored the one who lives forever. So check it out. Listen. You, you could get everything back. You can get your sanity back. You can get your family back. You can get your health back. But here, you got to put... Jesus on the throne. I just want to say, everybody in the room, myself included, you and I are crummy kings. I'm terrible. Trying to call the shots in my own life. I'm terrible. I'm a crummy king. That's why in 1985, I I thought I was all that in a bag of chips. But there's still something in my heart. I I was missing something. And I realized it wasn't something, it was someone. And honestly, we're cruddy kings. That's why he came 2,000 years ago. Because he said, you don't have to be a king. I'll be the king for you. Now, I know every time we have an Easter, there's people who are thinking, yeah, but you don't know what I've done. Do you know there's nothing you can do to out the cross of Jesus Christ? I don't, you, you throw it out. You throw it out. You say, well, I had a couple of abortions. It doesn't matter. It's under the blood of Jesus if you repent of it. You could have murdered someone. You could have been in a gang. You could have thir- 13 years in prison. You could have been a gangbanger. You na- we got people all, all over this building right now that are in situations that I just mentioned. Just watch your purse. I'm just kidding. No, but we're all messed up. Listen, there's nothing that you've done or said that can trump the love and the grace of God. Let me, let me just go Bible on you. Ab- we're just like, all oh, the people in the Bible were amazing. Abraham, the father of nations liar and killed somebody. Rahab, we talked about Rahab and the young adults a couple of weeks ago. Prostitute. She was a prostitute and she finds her way in Hebrews 11, the hall of faith. Prostitute. David, a man after God's own heart is what the Bible says. He committed adultery and then killed Uriah. Peter, we're like, oh, he's amazing. He preached in the book of Acts. 3,000 came to Christ. I know, but he denied the Lord three times. We could just go on and on with people in the Bible that were a train wreck. The Apostle Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, killed Christians before he became one. There's nothing you've done to outsend the cross of Jesus Christ. So I just want to ask you a question. I want you to look up here on the screen. I want to ask you, what category are you in tonight? A, B, or C. Number one. Maybe number one, Jesus is already my king. Come on, just with your hand, you know that you know that you know that you know that you've already made Christ your king. Amen, amen. Praise God, praise God. You can put your hands down. Already done it. And check, because you've already done it, we have a home in heaven. We have hope in this life. Already. I've already done it. I did it in 1985. Man, I was on the religion train. Then I met Jesus, and I have a personal relationship with it. My life hasn't been perfect, but God's with me every step of the way. I'm, I know that I know that I know. I've already made him my king. Secondly, maybe you might be here. Jesus already. Number two, I want to, I want to begin. I want to begin. So again, let me just say, of course, of course, I, I'm at church on Easter. And I would say, maybe, maybe. You don't have a relation with Christ. You don't go to heaven because you believe there's a God. You're an American. 
you own a Bible and you come to church. You have to have a personal relationship with God. But maybe you're B. I want to begin that. Or, or C. Is it C? I want to come back to the king. So yeah, man, there, maybe last year at Easter or two years ago or five years ago, I was really on fire for the Lord. That's what's so cool about God. He, he never just says, you're out of here, man. I already gave you a chance. How many of you know he's a God of second chances, third chances, 10 chances, right? Now listen, listen. Here's God. Here's God. He's knocking on the door of your heart right now. Now listen, he, he is king, but he's not your king until you coronate him king. And he's knocking on the door of your heart. Listen, he's giving you a choice to either accept him or reject him. Otherwise, we'd just be a bunch of robots if he forced us to follow him. He says, no, I first of all express my love to you 2,000 years ago by sending you my son. Now I want you to express your love back to me by coronating Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. So praise God. If you're in number one, already king, praise God. Come on. We're, we're, listen, we're sons and daughters of God. We're brothers and sisters in Jesus. But I just, I just wonder if there's anybody, maybe I want to begin. I want to begin. I, I, man, if you were to ask me before the service, I, I would have thought I'm a Christian. I've never killed anybody or robbed a bank. I want to begin a relationship with Christ. Now, now I know that he is king, but I, I've never coronated king in my life. I want to do that. Or C, at, at one time you used to follow the Lord, but through circumstances, through life, you've just drifted away. Listen, God's calling you back. Son, 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 daughter, daughter, I love you. He's knocking on your heart. This is the most important part of the service. Would you just bow your heads there right now? Just everybody, please don't move around or look around. Just, if you're already a Christian, he's already your king. I just would ask right now that you would pray. That God would just begin to move on the hearts of the people that need to begin a relationship with Christ or need to come back to Christ. So let me say it again. 2,000 years ago, he expressed his love to you by sending his son and he is king and he wants you to coronate him king either the first time or you want to rededicate your life I want to start on my right side which is the left side of the building I'm going to ask you to do four or five things if you would I'm not listen I'm not asking you to join the church if you did that that would be wonderful but this is just an invitation to begin a relationship with Christ or to come back to him and I want to ask you to just do a couple things. Everybody's got their eyes closed, their heads bowed. They're praying for you right now. But if you are either B or C, I want to begin a relationship or I want to come back to Christ. Right now, would you lift up your heads, open up your eyes, raise your hand. And I just want to agree with you that you're believing in Christ. I agree with you. 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 Agree with you. There's probably 15 or 20 people in this section. God bless each and every one of you. Amen. Amen. Amen, you can put your hands down. And we will applaud at the very end, but just out of respect for what God's doing right now. Anybody here in the middle section? Just go and lift up, open up your eyes, lift up your head, raise your hand, Got nothing to be embarrassed of, nothing to be ashamed of. It's the best decision you've ever made. I agree with you in Jesus' name. You, 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 you. Amen, amen. Thank you, man, that's awesome, thank you. God bless you, amen, I see your hand. I'm going off to my left, the far right side of the building. These two sections here. Come on, just lift up your head, raise your hand, look right at me. Come on, get your hand up there. It's the greatest decision. I, I agree with you in the name of Jesus. Either you're beginning a, a relationship with Jesus or you're coming back to him. You may put your hands down. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'd like everybody to stand to your feet if you would. Hallelujah. One more time, if you would just close your eyes there. Would you, everybody in the room, would you repeat this prayer after me? Father in heaven, I thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus. And tonight, March 30th, 
2024, on Resurrection Weekend, I turn from my ways, from my will, and I turn to Jesus Christ. And I declare with my mouth and in my heart that Jesus Christ is my King. I declare you are the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, and tonight, I invite you to come into my heart to be my Lord and to be my Savior. In Jesus' name. And everyone said amen.